Well, thank you. Welcome everyone in uh, our physically separated um, but uh, socially connected world here with the virtual scene here and we continue our um, series of, of amazing talks with a uh, friend, uh, Matt Stern, um, from across the country. Uh, Matt does not require an introduction, really. He's done it all. He's um, just a really um, a renaissance man, uh, I guess we can say in some ways. So he uh, is um, a professor at the Perelman uh, School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He has um, trained all over from Harvard. He did um, his medical degree at Duke and then ended up um, at UPenn for uh, his neurology training and it sounds like he's pretty much stayed on in the East Coast there um, and has really just, you know, popped around in many societies. He was um, uh, on, uh, I think he was, was it the president of the Movement Disorder Society at some point. Um, he was, uh, just did so many things, was really active in the American Academy of Neurology. Um, really one of the founding fathers of our field, um, and I don't want to date him with that, but, uh, you know, he really has been around for a while and seen um, the ebb and flow of medications that have come in and, and come in and out of favor, which we'll hopefully um, touch on today a little bit about um, some of the myths of maybe levodopa treatments we'll talk about a little bit later on. And um, he actually started uh, the Padrix, which I'm proud to be um, the uh, director of here, one of them, the Southwest Patrick, but he's been at the Northeast Patrick um, uh, as, as the founding director there originally and has um, continued to mentor uh, John Duda and many of my colleagues over there. So really just a leader on, on so many levels. So uh, maybe Matt, we'll, we'll start out by, uh, we were just reminiscing about some stories of some of our colleagues, but uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what uh, brought you to medicine, what inspired you to become a neurologist, and then um, be interested in Parkinson's disease. Indu, thank you so much, and thanks for inviting me, and um, I just want to congratulate all the folks at the PMD Alliance for the great job that they do and uh, what they provide to patients all over the place. It's really, a, it's a great, uh, it's a terrific service, and we're all very proud to be associated in any way with, with you all. Um, and of course, uh, those of you in Indu's neck of the woods are lucky to have her there um, because as much as her introduction was very kind and generous to me, she also has accomplished a tremendous amount there. Um, I got very interested in, um, in neuroscience back in the 70s, which some of you may remember was a very heady time for uh, discoveries in our field, particularly in the uh, area of neuropharmacology. Um, there was a lot of experimentation with neurologically active and psychologically active chemicals. And um, in medical school, I ended up spending time at the National Institute of Mental Health in Washington. And much of what I was doing involved, um, involved looking at neurochemicals, particularly in patients with psychiatric and neurological diseases, psychiatric diseases like severe depression, bipolar disease, um, and then in Parkinson's disease, of course, that was right around the time that, um, that L-DOPA was, was uh, developed. And it was a very exciting time for anybody in that field to realize that we could actually manipulate a chemical and get a, a profound clinical response. Uh, so that was really how I ended up in, in neuroscience. Um, came on and did my residency at Penn and stayed on the faculty, started the Parkinson's Disease Center there in the early 1980s. Um, and here I am. That's amazing. Um, so maybe um, we could start, Matt, with you telling us a little bit about some of your work because we worked together on a study called the PARS study. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about this passion that you've developed for trying to identify um, patients with Parkinson's um, before they ever even get symptoms. So, you know, a population that might be at risk for getting Parkinson's and why that would matter and why, you know, we should be still interested in that, um, you know, this, sure. this years later. Well, you know, we developed a number of, of treatments and, and treatment of, as, as all of you know, um, the treatment of Parkinson's disease is, is very effective and, and we're very proud of what we're able to do for patients. Um, but we realized pretty early on that patients, of course, as you know, continue to evolve symptoms. And even though patients live with Parkinson's for years and years and years, um, it was very early on that we realized that if we were really going to make a dent 
in the long-term natural history of Parkinson's disease, we were somehow going to have to figure out how to slow the progression of disease down. And in the mid 1980s, early 1990s, we got very excited about some of the mechanisms that were being uncovered, particularly in animal models, that suggested that we may actually be able to interfere with the disease process. And beginning in the mid 1980s, we began a series of, of, of clinical trials to actually look and see whether we could slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease with, with chemicals. I won't go into the details on, on the mechanisms of action, but suffice it to say, um, most of these compounds were very exciting in the laboratory um, and ultimately did not pan out to show a significant effect in these clinical trials. And we began to ask ourselves, well, what's, you know, why are we seeing these robust changes and, and effects in the laboratory but we're not seeing these changes when we do these clinical trials in patients with early Parkinson's disease. And what began to intrigue me and, and others was the concept of not getting in there early enough with our therapies. That by the time patients were developing clinical symptoms, there were changes that may not be significant to, to patients in terms of how bad their symptoms were. But in order to actually affect changes in, in those pathologic changes, we weren't getting in early enough. Um, and so the whole concept of how can we, how can we start these therapies earlier, uh, that would require diagnosing Parkinson's disease before patients develop symptoms. And I think everybody agreed that that, that was really the, the challenge, was, was really trying to figure out 10 years before patients develop Parkinson's disease, um, would that be the right time to introduce some of these therapies? Um, and, and that's really what the impetus for this effort amongst me and, and my colleagues and, and Indu and others to look at um, markers of, of Parkinson's disease. We knew at Penn, for example, for many years, we had done studies in the 80s on smell function, for example. And we were able to show that patients, even in the very earliest stages of Parkinson's disease, had a profound loss in, in their sense of smell. Many of them didn't even know it. Um, so that was a clue to us. Even as far back as the mid-1980s, it was a clue to us that something is going on before patients develop tremor and slowness of movement and, and the other Parkinsonian symptoms. And we use that to sort of further our, our, our work and our energy in uncovering other potential markers of Parkinson's disease. And, and that was the impetus for, for starting this study called the PARS study, which was really the first study of its kind um, to see if we can identify patients with Parkinson's disease before they actually develop Parkinson's disease. And I won't go into great detail, but suffice it to say that we um, identified a large number of patients who did not have Parkinson's disease, but who had significant loss of their ability to identify odors, smell loss. And we took a group of them and we imaged them with a, a dopamine receptor ligand. So we could actually, at that point, 10 years ago, or even more now, um, look at dopamine, uh, something called the dopamine transporter, which was a measure of dopamine function in the brain. And what we found, and this is actually, the, the latest version is in press now, it's soon to be published, uh, is that about two thirds of individuals who were normal at the time they were recruited into the study, but had loss of sense of smell and had an abnormality on that dopamine scan, uh, developed Parkinson's disease in, in six years of follow-up. So that is a remarkable observation. That basically tells us that we now have the tools to identify patients that are at risk for developing Parkinson's disease. And the next step in that whole process, of course, will be to figure out a way to identify these in large numbers and actually do a clinical trial to see if we can actually delay the onset of Parkinson's disease. And I want you to put this in perspective. If you live with Parkinson's disease for 30 years, let's say, and if you're 50 years old, you're, you're gonna live with Parkinson's disease for a long time. And we can actually slow the progression by a few percentage points a year, a small amount, that's going to have a profound effect on your lifespan and your well-being over a long period of time. So we don't necessarily have to stop progression in its tracks. We don't necessarily have to cure the disease. 
all we have to do is, is slow down the pathologic process a little bit, and it would make a huge difference in, in patients' lives. And I think that's where the field is going now. That's where, where I'm interested in heading. So when people talk about cures and, you know, we don't, you know, it'd be nice to have a cure, but we can change people's lives dramatically with what we have available to us today and what we're going to have available to us uh, in terms of slowing progression down. That will have a dramatic impact. So my mission is not necessarily to cure Parkinson's, it's really to substantially reduce its impact so that you basically have it, but it's not having the, the impact on your lives that it may have now. Wow, that's really right hot off the press. I had no idea and in inviting you here today that we would find out something that's just literally in, gonna be published um, in the next few months. So that's really exciting. That is really exciting. Um, I was not aware that that was the update. So with, within six years, many of these people were converting to Parkinson's, two thirds. That's of right. Parkinson's. And these patients were, did not have Parkinson's disease when they came into the study. So, um, and, and it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's huge because if you can begin to imagine, well, how can we convert that into a clinical trial now? You know, can we recruit hundreds and hundreds of these patients that are destined to develop Parkinson's disease and enroll them in a clinical trial to show that we can actually slow down the onset of, of disease? I don't know what you think, Indu, but I, you know, I've always thought that some of the drugs that we had um, would have worked had we used them at the right time. You know, take an MAOB inhibitor, for example. There were, there were enough signals with that, uh, even in early disease, that what would have happened if we moved, you know, we moved the whole pattern backwards about five years, and that little two-point change in, in UPDRS at the end of the Adagio study, for example, what would have that looked like had we started the therapy five years before symptoms uh, started? Yeah. Uh, and I think yeah. that's it. No, I think that that was, has been a lot of the question is by the time people present in our offices with motor Parkinson's, so with a tremor, or with stiffness and slowness, the cat's kind of already out of the bag and we've already had some changes in those cells um, to a significant degree that may be, you know, um, far on in the, in the sort of the progression. Uh, and if we can kind of back that clock up and look for this population that might be at risk, it would be really exciting. And even to the patients that are out there and the caregivers that are watching, um, I think it's still very important. Um, you know, one, one might say, well, I already have Parkinson's and I've had it for five or 10 years. Why do I care about this data? Um, there is a, could, could you just speak to, because I know that we've, we've talked a little bit about what the chance of a first degree relative um, who is related, um, and maybe we could define what that is um, as well before we speak to that. Um, let's say you are that person who's 50, who's, who's had Parkin, who then goes on and has Parkinson's for 30 years. What is the chance of somebody who's related to that 50 year old um, of getting Parkinson's disease, um, either their child or their brother? Well, if you don't have a, you know, a genetic form of Parkinson's, um, then I like to reassure patients that the odds are low. They're greater than you or I, uh, but they're still pretty low, you know, somewhere in the single digit percentage points. So the, you know, the risk is greater, again, greater than it is for the normal population, but probably in the realm of 5% or something like that. So I don't like folks to get nervous about having an offspring or kid or relative with Parkinson's disease, unless they have one of the genetic forms of Parkinson's disease, which most people, most people don't. Oh. Right. So it's pretty low. If you, ha if you have Parkinson's and you're the only one in your family, um, it's quite unlikely that anyone who's related to you will get it. But I think as a community of people who care about this disease and trying to move sort of the needle um, and the disease uh, forward in, in some positive way in terms of treatment, I think that we should all care about this and, and work towards helping um, recruit patients and identify populations that might be at risk. So you spoke about the sense of smell as the main thing and then also this imaging study. Um, were there other things that, um, was that two thirds just the sense of smell or was, were there other um, factors like? Well, we now know, we, we, we looked at that, we looked at constipation and you know mood and things like that. We now know that there are a number of factors that predate the onset of symptoms. For example, um, a, a disorder called REM sleep behavior disorder. This is people who uh, enact, act out their dreams and they flail around at night and throw themselves out of bed. Um, it turns out that somewhere, you know, upwards of 50% or more of those individuals will go on in the next decade and develop um, Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative disorders. 
So that's another clue that something's happening um, long before uh, patients develop the typical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. We also know, for example, that if you ask patients with Parkinson's disease about their history of, of constipation, um, a common problem that a lot of elderly people have, but it seems to be a little higher uh, in patients with Parkinson's. And we now know that the, the, the gut um, also has pathologic changes that are not dissimilar from what we see in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease. So there's a signal there as well. And there's a connection between the GI tract and the brain. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting research now on, on that you may have heard about, about the gut um, microbiome, the, sort of the population of bacteria in, in the gut, and how that may relate to the onset of uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. And you'll hear a lot more about that uh, in the next few years. Um, so Matt, if you had a patient population, let's say we had five people that had this abnormal sense of smell, um, and uh, let's say had a DAT scan that looked like it was, you know, starting to be changing. What would you do with them? What would you tell that population? Really, it's a really great question, Indu. And I've actually, we're at the point now where I've actually had people who have had that, or at least had an abnormal sense of smell and REM sleep behavior disorder. And they come up to you and they say, well, okay, I've got this, I've got REM sleep behavior disorder. It's been diagnosed. Uh, I don't have a good sense of smell or I don't have any sense of smell at all. Um, what should I do? And this is, this gets really controversial amongst me and, and my colleagues. And, and all I can tell you is what I would do. Yep. And I would, want to know I, I would probably, I would probably get a DAT scan on that patient. And if the scan was in the, you know, the, the abnormal range that we see in preclinical Parkinson's disease, um, here's what I would do. And, and this is, uh, I wish they weren't, this wasn't being recorded because someone's going to come back and, <laughs> and, and make fun of me for this. But um, there's enough tantalizing data on MAOB inhibitors that I would probably start that patient on an MAOB inhibitor. Harmless, doesn't seem to have any long-term adverse effects. And why not? It might help. If it, if it works a little bit, then, then that would be a good thing. And then there are a whole lot of lifestyle things that have received a lot of attention um, in Parkinson's disease, like exercise, for example. Um, there, there is data that exercise reduces the risk of Parkinson's disease, certainly reduces the severity of Parkinson's disease. Diet, you know, the Mediterranean diet has been studied and it appears to have a lower risk of, so, so there are lifestyle things, stress reduction, um, it might help patients with their retirement planning. Um, so there's a whole lot that could be done if you knew you were destined to develop this. Not that there's not a lot we can do now, and perhaps we'll talk about that, but um, I, I, think, I think we're okay. We're in an era where we can begin to talk about the importance of making this determination um, before patients develop symptoms. Okay. That's, that's great. Um, and I'm so happy to hear people talking about lifestyle because that's something that I, you know, spent a lot of time and energy caring about and trying to you know, study separately, as you know. Um, so I think that that is a huge component. And I think that you also, when we were speaking earlier, um, you talked to me a little bit about, um, and, and this is a little bit of a tangent, we'll get back to sort of what we were talking about, but, but I think you were talking about empowerment and also attitude of patients and sort of um, customizing things and, and the people that you feel are the recipe for success. Maybe, because I don't want to miss out on that, um, maybe you could tell me, since you have such a wealth of experience and knowledge and people are saying that you look too young to be a founding father already. So you've already got some compliments here in the chat, but, um, but since we have you here and, and we can pick your brain a little bit. Well, I think that, I mean, those are really important questions. And, and what I've learned um, after many years of, of spending time with patients, some of whom have become really close friends, is that what's important to an individual patient is not necessarily important to the person that walks in your door next. And what is important for us as clinicians to do is to try as best we can understand what it is about that individual patient that determines their sense of well-being. And, and that differs from individual to individual. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to get a good handle on, on that individual patient's sen you know, sense of well-being. What is it that um, gives that person their own sense of, of well-being and how can we help facilitate that? 
And medications, of course, is, is only part of it. It's understanding you know, that person's lifestyle uh, and how we as, as expert clinicians can use our expertise to help them achieve that. Um, and you never know what goes on behind the closed examination room door. So that um, you know, I, some of our most famous colleagues, I'm not sure are necessarily so terrific <laughs> behind the, that exam room door. Um, but it's something I've learned. And um, I may not recognize the patient's face that I haven't seen in six months, but I can tell you what their golf handicap is. And I can tell you the last time they went fishing and what they caught. <laughs> and um, and I, I think that's, it's a really important skill to develop as a, as a good clinician. Uh, because there is so much we can do even now, you know, forgetting the slowing progression. Uh, in a sense, the, the therapies that we have available to us now have allowed us to alter the natural history of Parkinson's disease. And, and many of my patients are, as I said, are my friends. I play golf with them. They're living rich and full lives. And, and that's sort of our goal. Um, I always tell my patients that my goal is to help them die young later. Well, you have the fountain of youth for sure there, Matt. So you got to give us some of your secrets. But I, I mean, I think that's really powerful because, um, you know, we don't learn these things in medical school. And, um, you know, I, as you know, I, I ended up doing a board in integrative medicine last year and have spent, you know, 20 years being a Western trained doctor, but trying to figure out, you know, the key to guide my patients both at the VA side. And I have a lot of younger women patients um, that I had taken care of at the UCLA side. And every patient is different. What makes them tick is different. How do you even ask that and get sort of under an understanding of, you know, really their purpose in a holistic way is, is I think an art that we don't teach really that well. Um, in medical school and probably in residency or you know even in fellowship it's something that you, you gain insight so when when you're thinking about that and i think it will be helpful to patients maybe to help them to formulate what that is for them how do you ask that um you know to a patient how do how do you kind of evolve the conversation to ask well them i don't think it's well-being it, is or you know yeah, it's not a single it's not a single question it's it's really um i think you have to you have to be you have to be sensitive um, to, to individual patients. And, you know, the tendency amongst busy doctors like us dealing with Parkinsonian symptoms is to ask the patient about their primary symptoms. How's your tremor? How's your slowness? Is your medicine effective? Is it wearing off? And, I, and patients will say, my tremor is doing pretty well. I could use a little bit better treatment. And, and you focus on that. Uh, and um, it's unless you ask them about their mood. How are you sleeping? How are you feeling? Is your, are you sad? Are you, you know, are you anxious? Do you have pain? Um, that we begin to get a handle and that patient begins to open up. And I remember, I'll just tell you one quick example. Um, I had to give a talk once on the non-motor aspects of Parkinson's disease. These are uh, symptoms that are not the typical motor symptoms like tremor. These are symptoms like depression and anxiety and pain, bowel and bladder problems. And in order to give that lecture, I decided to set up a video camera in my office. And the first patient that walked in was a 53 year old man. And I said, do you mind if I videotape the session? He said, sure. And I said, how are you feeling? You know, the typical question that we ask and patients don't want to tell their doctor that they're feeling badly. They don't want to be told they're doing well. He said, I'm doing okay. I said, is anything bothering you? Does your tremor bother you? He said, yes, my tremor sometimes bothers me. And I said, well, if we treat that tremor, if I increase your medications and make that tremor go away, would you be happy? He said, absolutely, I'd be thrilled. That would be great, thank you very much. So I turned the camera off. I said, do you mind if I turn the camera back on and ask you a few more questions? He said, sure. I said, how are you sleeping? He said, terribly, I'm up all night long. I said, why are you up all night long? He said, because I gotta go to the bathroom all the time. And then I said, well, how are you, you know, how's your mood? my wife thinks I'm really depressed. And it went on from there. And every question I asked, um, he answered affirmatively. And that was a very important lesson, both to me and the people I gave that lecture to, in that you got to ask the question if you're going to hear what it is that's bothering an individual patients. Because patients, as, as the people on this call will attest, you know, will not tell a doctor everything unless the doctor asks. Uh, think about it. You know, if you're living with any kind of chronic illness, um, you want to leave the doctor's office with the doctor telling you that you're doing well, not that you're getting worse. 
And so there's a natural inclination to avoid sharing uh, some of these symptoms that are really bothersome to people. And they can be pretty subtle. Um, some of the friends I have that have Parkinson's um, look exactly the same all day long. But periodically throughout the day, they'll have periods of, of, of real despair and sadness. And it really is a wearing off of medication manifestation. And, and that needs to be treated. And unless, unless a doctor discovers it, it's not going to get treated. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is the right, you know, the rapport that you get, the sort of path of the questions and kind of getting, getting a sense of these other things. And I think the more we learn about the non-motor issues in Parkinson's, I'm just floored by how complex they are. And so I think we've, we've done a pretty good job of treating the motor aspects, but it's really these non-motor aspects that are profoundly um, difficult to, to treat. And, and well, they're difficult we're... because people are not patients are not cued in to talking about it unless yep. doctors ask them about it. They're yep. no different than the motor manifestations in terms of their response to medication, most of them. And, and, and if you ask a patient who has classic wearing off to actually describe what's happening to them as they, as they go into that off state, they're, they're loaded with non-motor or, you know, non-motor symptoms uh, on the way, on the way off. Yeah. Um, and I think doctors need to recognize that it's really important because again, it's, it's totally treatable. Yeah. And in the chat here, people are talking about things like apathy and, you know, other mood things as well that are, that are very tough on patients. And then also some people have mentioned that they only have 15 minutes sometimes with their doctor. And so it becomes, you know, hard to squeeze it all in, but I think writing things down and, you know, the things that the lists of symptoms that may are, are most bothersome to you is, is definitely important. And hopefully through this series of of chats where we're getting a sense of what, you know, I think um, many doctors feel are really game changers for their patients. So maybe we'll segue on um, that from there a little bit into, I think some interesting things since you've been in the um, business of treating Parkinson's and, and also, you know, the art of treating Parkinson's over the years with your patients. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about levodopa and sort of the evolution of, um, you know, kind of how you see when it, kind of got started out there as a, as a therapy and then also some of the myths and the, the hype and the media and sort of the dopamine, the um, sort of fear of taking levodopa um, as well and, and maybe bring us sort of from, from sort of the beginning because I think you, you did that well in, in the, you, you're, you're hosting a number of talks um, on this uh, Panorama Patient Network um, that you had talked about and we'll put that in the links here. Um, but Matt's done a beautiful job of interviewing some of our colleagues out on, um, and, and some patients as well have been involved in that series uh, as well. And so I think we can, we can definitely point patients in that direction to watch some of those videos. But I think you do a, a nice job of talking about the history of levodopa and sort of bringing us up to the current sort of situation. So perhaps you can help us meander through that conversation a little bit. Well, I mean, it was a very obviously exciting time for neurology in, in general and medicine in general, because this was uh, the discovery of, of Levodopa was really a remarkable turning point in the treatment of, of Parkinson's disease. And I urge you to watch uh, the movie Awakenings, the Oliver Sacks book that was turned into a movie. It's a fabulous movie and it uh, talks about the early days of experimenting with, with Levodopa. And it took real perseverance because the, this is another example of where the initial trials were, were negative uh, or there were so many side effects because you had to use so much of, of levodopa. This is before we combined it with carbidopa. Um, but once we did, uh, it became just a, a dramatic treatment for patients with, with Parkinson's disease. And, uh, and the problem initially was that, um, you know, we just used as much as, as we wanted to to get patients moving again. And there was a little bit of a double-edged sword because it was realized pretty quickly that, um, that there were some problems associated with, with levodopa. Um, and you all know what they are. Patients developed complications, involuntary movements, um, so-called dyskinesias. Um, patients as their disease advanced would need to use more and more of it. Um, but it was still in those early days where we used really high doses. And I remember patients with really, really severe uh, abnormal involuntary movements, dyskinesia, they were very, very hard to manage. Um, and that fueled a, a search for other medications. Um, and so we developed, and, and, you, and many of you have, I'm sure, ex, uh, been on some of these medications, but we now have a whole host of other medications that were all designed to try and reduce the exposure to, to massive doses of levodopa. 
Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum is what we refer to as a levodopa phobia that unfortunately physicians, um, doctors and patients with that background developed a fear of using levodopa at all. And there was a myth circulating that you only had a few years of good response and you should really not take levodopa until you absolutely have to. And that is a total myth that uh, unfortunately has led to worsening in a number of patients uh, that, that didn't really, should never have gotten there. Uh, and now we've sort of come full circle and we recognize how great a drug this really is. And as long as we use it judiciously, um, there should be no reason not to use it and just combine it with other medications uh, as, as need be. Uh, and there's also some evidence now that um, early intervention uh, and early symptomatic benefit translates into a better long-term course. So delaying the use of levodopa really doesn't have any basis in the modern treatment of Parkinson's disease, particularly because we're using it more judiciously, we're using it with uh, other medications, and we have other treatments now available to us for treating some of the complications. Um, and, and those treatments are really quite quite remarkable, and we're constantly improving our levodopa delivery strategy. So some of you may know that there's a continuous infusion form of levodopa. Um, there's an inhaled form of levodopa that um, is very effective for patients that have wearing off symptoms that can be used very, um, uh, can be used whenever you need it. Um, there are uh, transcutaneous forms being developed. So it's really come full circle after all this exploration of other mechanisms of drug uh, delivery and drug action, we're now looking for the best delivery strategies for, for levodopa because it's such an effective drug. We're trying to get as, you know, approximate as closely as possible what happens in, in, normal, in the normal state. So it's really been a dramatic story over these last 50 years and I'm, I still marvel at it. Okay. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I think that that sense of the, the phobia has really put patients and doctors sometimes as, at a disadvantage in the sense of, you know, you see somebody with profound disability sometimes and they're not able to do the lifestyle things like exercise, which I think you and I would agree are hugely important from even day one of Parkinson's. And they're kind of losing out on the sort of beneficial things that may be helping sort of modify their disease because they're worried about taking a medication that um, really can, you know, help change their lives. Um, and I also think that um, there's been this sense that they have to keep it in their back pocket until some rainy day because it has um, a limited time of efficacy. Could you speak to that limited time of efficacy? Yeah, it's just like? not. It's, it's just not true, and it's. I, I don't. I think it's it's uh, it's bad practice. So, uh, if someone asks me uh, when to start levodopa, you know, I, I started when patients have symptoms, um, and and you know, for a long time we used to start with dopamine agonists, but if you think about the side effects of dopamine agonists. Um, and were we really providing patients with the benefit of reducing levodopa exposure? Um, no, everybody sort of ended up on, on the same combination after a few years, and, and, and they did well as long as we kept the dose reasonably, you know, re at reasonable levels. Um, but the point is, is that I am much more compulsive about having a patient live normally. Um, even that 55-year-old or 60-year-old who's working, who has a little tremor, um, I'm much more compulsive about having them live as normal as possible from the beginning. And so I don't hesitate to start with a little bit of levodopa right from, from that point. Uh, I discuss it with the patient. I discuss my long-term strategy and uh, will often start a patient on a few hundred milligrams of levodopa right then. Could you speak a little bit, because you did on that, um, the Panorama Network um, uh, episode about the L-DOPA study um, and what we found in that study um, that was, I think, kind of surprising? Well, yeah, despite the fact that we've been, you know, had years and years of experience with uh, levodopa, there had never really been a good dose response study in, in early untreated patients. Um, and we were interested to know whether levodopa had any bad effects on patients. To, we tried to sort of address this myth. And without going into great detail, the bottom line is, uh, is that, um, there was no evidence that levodopa did anything bad. And in fact, there was some evidence that the patients on higher doses um, were better after withdrawal of the medication. Um, 
and this, this is really sort of fine tuning, but people say, well, there's a long duration effect and uh, two weeks isn't enough to wash it out. But really, I mean, to me, um, two weeks is a pretty long time. And to see that difference between the higher dose and the lower dose group and placebo uh, certainly made me wonder whether we weren't having a beneficial effect. So the bottom line is no toxic, no bad effects from levodopa and probably some uh, healthy effects uh, from, from using it in patients with early, otherwise untreated disease in that study. Sounds good. And um, I think we also have data, you know, we took we have this Hone and Yar staging scale where we were, which was really devised in the pre cinemat era, um, where these two clinicians, you know, saw people go from stage one to stage five within five to 10 years of disease. I mean, they were going from mild symptoms, sometimes on one side to sometimes being bed bound and wheelchair bound within five to 10 years. And we've really changed the progression of the disease in a huge way with um, our therapies. And I think that, you know, this sort of sense that early, we try to find as early a time frame as possible for um, identifying patients and then um, perhaps drizzle in things like exercise and lifestyle strategies. I totally agree with, you know, the Mediterranean diet, maybe sleeping right, eating right, mind body approaches, maybe, you know, meditation, yoga, things like that. And then maybe starting an MAOB inhibitor early, once you have symptoms, it sounds like you're thinking, you know, the judicious use of levodopa, you know, early on, and then, you know, changing, changing medications as, as disabilities changing with the patient, being mindful of these wearing off timeframes, the non-motor symptoms and things like that. Is, does that sound about right? Yeah, I blood? think that does. Again, um, the caveat is that every individual is unique and you have to tailor your approach to, uh, to, to that individual. The interesting thing to me, and I don't know what you think about this, Indu, but you know, if you look at the standard of care for patients with advanced disease, there's a pretty, pretty standard way we approach it. I mean, you may choose a different intervention, but you know, these patients that are on levodopa for many years and will add an adjunct, and then we may do uh, deep brain stimulation, but we don't have much of an argument but to me, there's no standard of care for that patient with early newly diagnosed Parkinson's disease. There's a lot of debate, should I start levodopa? Should I start an MAOB inhibitor? But there's really no standard of care. And it's one of the things that's really interested me. And um, you know, and when I put my consulting hat on, I try to get uh, some of the developers of some of the newer medications to really study it um, in early disease, perhaps in combination with levodopa to see if we can alter the natural history of treated disease, because that's really what we're really after. Yeah. Uh, but right now, there's no standard of care for uh, early Parkinson's disease. So when, you know, when someone asks, when should I start levodopa, I gave you my answer, but you talk to three or four other experts, and you may get three or four different opinions. Um, and that's a challenge, I think. Absolutely. Well, it's good to hear, though, from you, because you've literally, I feel like these pendulum swing as we've been in um, practice, and there's sort of this phobia and then now an adoption that it really, you know, does make a difference. But I think that you and I share the thoughts that I think trying to find out what makes people's lives rich, what makes them tick, what they enjoy, what brings them, you know, happiness um, is really key. And then trying to keep them doing those things um, as best we can as doctors um, for as long as possible is really my hope not to worry too much about this scale or that scale or, you know, these other things. And I think some of the, um, the thoughts that you've also been um, talking about is sort of looking at more patient-centered outcome measures um, and ways to really capture some of these things that I think we've not done terribly well with some of our scales historically. Maybe yeah, for sure. I think you're exactly right. I think the scales that we use um, do not tell the story. And so uh, if I'm evaluating a patient, um, what do you think the patient wants to feel better or the, or the knowledge that their rating scale is a little bit better, even though they don't feel any different. So I'd much rather hear how a patient is feeling. Are you better? Do you feel well? What's bothering you? Um, and then before they leave, am I supposed to tell them, oh, guess what? Your tremor scale is a little better than it was four months ago. I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense. And yet that's what we're measuring in, in these clinical trials. Yeah. And I think the methodology is really, um, really leaves a lot to be desired. Absolutely. So you've been really in the know of the dopamine agonist, um, you know, time frame of when it came out and how it's 
was in favor. And then, you know, as it's come up, maybe you could speak, cause we haven't really spoken much about this, maybe for five minutes, a little bit on the um, impulse control disorder issue. We had Dan Weintraub, who's a close colleague of yours, come on. And I know that you guys created this quip scale um, together. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit about that and tell the audience here a little bit about that and why we are, you know, not maybe using that as, as much and also to help them identify if they might be having some of these issues as well. Yeah, I mean, this was really a tragic story from, uh, from my standpoint because we knew nothing about it. And here's a, here are drugs that had gone through years and years and years of clinical trials and going through these clinical trials, safety is a huge part of the clinical trial. Um, and here we had these drugs and, and their safety revolved around acute side effects like nausea and you know, dizziness and, and things like that. Um, but lo and behold, we began to see patients and I'm guilty too, I had my own patients who, um, who had you know, impulse control issues revolving mostly around, um, around gambling um, and, and didn't associate the two of them for quite some time. Um, because patients wouldn't talk about it. And finally, patients began to come in and families used to, began to come in and say, I wonder if this is related to their Parkinson's. Um, my wife just went through $500,000 of our savings account on, on scratch, and, scratch tickets in Pennsylvania. And I'm thinking, that's a lot of scratching. <laughs> um, and, you know, we began to notice that a few patients actually you know, had this horrible uh, impulse control problems. And then there was hypersexuality and other manifestations, eating compulsively. Um, and it turned out that it was caused by the dopaminergic me me medications, particularly dopamine agonists. So, um, you know, I, I have to say that we had, um, at that time, I was involved with one of the companies that manufactures dopamine agonists. We had an emergency meeting and a couple of the people at that meeting were people that you have enormous respect for, whose names will, will not be mentioned, uh, who said, never seen it. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And we said, well, go back and start asking your patients. And lo and behold, um, you know, when everybody started asking their patients about things like impulse control, gambling, hypersexuality, sleepiness, excessive daytime sleepiness, um, it became clear that this was a big problem that had really gone undetected. Uh, and so, you know, once it was out there and once we knew what to look for, we could warn patients and we could ask patients about it. And no one started, you know, once it became available, or once it became known, we never started those drugs without saying to a patient, look, if anything like this happens, let us know. And I had a patient, I'll, I'll never forget her, a young woman who literally lost all of her savings, but the, but the medication she took really, really helped her. Said, look, you gotta stop it. And for a couple of years, she's you know, struggled and said, I really wanna try this medication again. And we gave her a related dopamine agonist. And I said to her, look, you know what happens, you know if you get this impulse, you have gotta let me know immediately. And she came back and described it beautifully. She said, you know, I, I knew exactly what was happening to me. I knew I was getting this impulse to gamble again, but I absolutely had no control over it. I knew it intellectually. I knew what it was, a very bright woman, but I had no control over it. And it just, it, it was really illustrative of how powerful um, these impulses are on, on some of these medications. So we're very careful now with, um, with drugs that can do that, about warning patients about that potential side effect. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, it, I think what we're realizing is that if we don't ask or if we don't get to know our patients well and keep an open line of communication that really we, we can miss things that are really pretty dramatic to them. So I think, you know, from, from day one, it's probably important to sort of just lay the foundation that there are, we're starting medications, you know, with this disease, there are many things that maybe just outside of what just the motor things that we've classically been taught to ask about and that, you know, we should learn about these um, and bring, bring these to our attention if, if things come up. So I think that's really, um, you know, part and parcel of, you know, a lot of the dialogue that we're having here. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you, um, as, as we've sort of um, talked a little bit, some, some people are asking more about the, um, the issues with what you were talking about with the wearing off and, um, and, and the non-motor offs, maybe. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit more to that, because um, I think that that is something that we, we, maybe you can define what on is, maybe you 
could define what off is and also what these sort of, um, you know, this, these sort of non yeah, I, mean, I don't love the uh, terminology here. I think there's always a little bit of a semantic issue between what we, you and I know, uh, what you and I talk about with each other when we talk about on and off and what patients really understand that to mean. Um, but there's this tendency to think about uh, patients who take their medication and they feel good for a period of time and then they don't feel good. Um, and that can mean their tremors worse, their slowness is worse, their stiffness is worse, or it can mean they're depressed, anxious, have pain in their foot or extremity, um, have bowel and bladder symptoms. But when the medicine's not working well, when it's suboptimal, that's what we as doctors refer to as off episodes. But the whole spectrum of off is so variable that I don't like to use that terminology. And it's important that patients begin to understand that there is a pattern throughout the day when they may be doing better or, or worse. Now, you know, in the old days, levodopa was so dramatic that patients would literally turn off. And when we used high doses and, um, and we began to see these changes, it was, it was dramatic. It's very different today. Now it's much more subtle because of the way we use these medications. So it's important that patients understand that there are going to be periods of, during the day when they may not be as optimized on their medication and they may feel it in a variety of different ways. Uh, they may feel it very subtly in terms of perhaps a little bit of fatigue or a little bit of anxiety, or they may feel it in, in typical motor ways with an increase in their tremor or stiffness. Um, and, and the nice thing is we have treatments for those as long as they share it with their doctor. And the problem is, is that a lot of patients don't fully understand that and don't really want to share it with their doctor. And their doctors, of course, are busy and they don't want to start you on a new medication because that takes a little bit of work. And they're, you know, they're, they're much happier if a patient says, I'm doing fine, just keep me on what I'm taking because it is their burden. So I think, you know, getting, getting on other, med you know, getting better treated um, depends upon you as patients going into your doctor and saying, look, um, I'm doing pretty well, but there are periods during the day where I think I could be doing better. And um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're frozen or you can't move. It just means that there are periods during the day that you think you might want to feel better. And there are things available to us now that, that are out there for just that kind of symptom. You know, we talked about the inhaled levodopa. We talked about there's, there's newer therapies coming out. There's, um, there's adjunctive medications. Um, and it's worth trying these things. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, you stop it. So I'm, for all, I'm one for always experimenting with, uh, with what's available out there. But it's going to come from you as the patient. You've got to go to the doctor and say, look, I, I want to try something. Um, I'm doing well, but I'm not doing 100%. I think I could be doing better. That sounds good. Um, so quick question. Um, so what are your, since you've been um, in the know of, you know, the world of Parkinson's for a number of years, um, if you were to say, you know, what are your top five um, new medications in the pipeline um, or that are recently out that you really are kind of excited about? Oh boy. Um... That's a tough one. I'm excited about. Well, and you want it? You did want me to just free flow when we I'm talked excited, about. No, I'm excited about the the novel levodopa delivery strategies. All of them. Um, I think those are really improving uh, our ability to more closely approximate what happens in the natural state. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about the um, the anti synuclein therapies. Um, but I would say cautiously optimistic. I'm, you know, these are, for those of you out there, these are therapies that are designed uh, to limit the accumulation of proteins that might accumulate in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease. This is another technique to get at the underlying progression, underlying mechanism of disease. Um, the problem is, is that these studies, again, have been done on patients with early Parkinson's disease at a time when, you know, making those changes may be may be difficult to prove. Um, but I think the concept is, is really a novel one and it's an intriguing one. And, and I hope that we see some, some benefit. Um, and, and because there are at least three of those, because there are at least three of those out there, 
and there are at least two new forms of levodopa delivery. I'll say those are my oh, those top are the five. five. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, another question. Um, I think there's been a few questions in the chat about toxicity of levodopa. Could you speak to that again and just, you know, say one Yeah, so the there's other? no evidence that levodopa is toxic to, uh, to nerve cells. Um, this has been proven in any number of different ways, uh, including years ago, you know, patients got high doses of levodopa that, that didn't have Parkinson's disease and the brains, uh, looking at those brains after death, those brains were normal. Um, there's no evidence that levodopa is toxic in, in animal models. And the study that Indu referred to earlier was a study in patients with Parkinson's disease using variable doses of Parkinson's disease. There's no evidence that patients that got the higher doses did worse. So um, the bottom line is there's no good evidence that, that levodopa is, is quote, neurotoxic. Um, so this group on, on our chat here is quite interested in advocacy. And um, I think that, you know, they're really, I think with the, the times that we're in right now and the sort of sense that we may be at a resetting time for, you know, medicine and the future. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to what you thought as patients um, they could advocate for. What are like some some number one or two kind of advocacy things that they could do? And I, I think we've uh, been, we've had Boss and Mike Oaken on with ending Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, Tanya Samuni was on. You know, we've had a number of people that have really spoken to some ideas, but I want to get your opinion on what are the top one or you two. Know, I think, I hate to be uh, mercenary about it, but I think the most really important thing is is um, is federal funding for for research in terms of advocacy, um, because I think what the the funders sometimes don't realize is how much can be accomplished by supporting research in Parkinson's disease. Because we're learning so much more about not just Parkinson's but other uh, neurologic diseases and the way the brain behaves by research that uncovers or that improves our understanding of Parkinson's disease. So advocacy for research funding is critical, particularly in our current political climate. Um, really, really important that, that you know, the NIH get maintained uh, at a high level. Um, I think that's, that's the biggest thing of all. Um, the other thing that just came to mind is that you know, diseases of aging, like Alzheimer's disease, um, is really going to reach epidemic proportions. Um, we're not equipped to handle it, really, um, medically or, or lifestyle-wise. We don't have the, the support to handle it. So um, I think advocacy groups have to, um, it would behoove them to work hard to try and get more funding um, for um, supporting our elderly population, which is growing dramatically uh, through a variety of means. But that worries me. We, we're all living through a pandemic right now, but um, aging and diseases of aging uh, in the next 20 years are going to be, you know, reach epidemic proportions in this country. And it'll be like a, it'll be like a pandemic in a different way. Um, and um, also uh, there's just um, there's so many questions in the chat. I think it's gonna be hard to cover all these. We might have to have you come back again, Matt. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wanted to just have you speak about um, uh, one or two, one last question about levodopa. So there's been some questions about like, am I on, to, is there a cap to how much cinemat I can be on? Is this affecting other organs in a negative way, like liver and things like that? Um, could you speak to that? And then I want to ask you one other thing. Yeah, we haven't seen evidence that um, levodopa affects other organ systems in, in, a, in a negative way. Um, and, and, you know, patients metabolize it at different levels. So you can't compare yourself with uh, your next door neighbor who's taking levodopa because what is an, a really high dose with side effects to one is a low ineffective dose to another. Uh, and we're all different. We all metabolize drugs differently. So, so we sometimes have to use high doses in some patients. Okay, that's great. Because, yeah, people always think that there's like a maximum number of pills or, you know, things. No, there, and I think there really is that's great. So I think we have four minutes left. So um, this has just been an absolute pleasure to have you on, Matt. Such a rich, um, you know, history of treating these patients and, you know, so much uh, work that you've done in advocating for this disease in various societies and just such a thought leader. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, 
what are your silver linings and sort of what are your hopes for the future for our patients in terms of how they can empower themselves, um, you know, with, with this disease? What would you say? Well, I think, I think your number, couple you, of number, number. Yeah, four? I think, I think you said it best when you said empower themselves. Um, this is a, a condition that can be treated. Um, you notice I said condition because I hate to even refer to it as a disease because you live with it for such a long period of time. Um, I, I, I really strongly urge patients to do exactly that, empower themselves, control their own uh, destiny here, tell the doctors what's going on and what you want, uh, encourage the doctor, you know, learn about the medications and encourage the doctor to consider trying a different medication in you if you're not doing so well. Um, and live a lifestyle that, that's conducive to your own sense of well-being. And, and you have to figure out what that is for yourself. For some, it's you know, taking a walk on the beach every day. For others, it's hitting the golf ball. For others, it's playing, you know, whatever it is, paint, do it, you know, figure it out what it is for yourself and, and ask your healthcare provider to help you get there. Um, because this is an eminently treatable condition with lots of new therapies and lots of current therapies that are available to help you live your best life. And, and that's really what, um, what we're all about. And as I said, I think Indus put a tremendous amount of energy and effort into that part of treating this uh, illness. And, and that's, I think, going to turn out to be where it's at for making patients better. It's not going to be finding a cure. We don't need a cure. That's not where we, you know, what we need is uh, patients to empower themselves to, to really improve their own sense of well-being. Uh, with the guidance of a, of a healthcare provider. That's amazing. Well, that's absolutely, I think, what it's about. And from my opinion, I think that the energy that you bring um, to this conversation and have inspired and you've trained, honestly, the legacy of your trainees is quite stunning. I mean, from my colleagues um, that are still at Penn, but across, across the world, honestly. So it's just um, great to see the passion. And part of my hope for the series is for for patients and you know, well, this will be recorded and available to everyone um, and in whatever country they're in, um, for people and their caregivers and people who care about Parkinson's patients to just see the, um, the, the passion and, and the brilliant minds that are, and the energy that I think has, has sort of really um, defined this field and why I fell in love with it and went into it and why you continue to do this work, um, you know, this many years, uh, we won't say how many years later, but this many years later, and, and I hope for the future, you know, as well, we'll, we'll have you to guide us, um, Matt. So I, I, I so thank you for, for, your, um, for your energy and, and your hard work and, and your inspiration to us all. Um, so I'll give you one last line maybe of, uh, of time and then we'll, we'll pass it back to the PMD Alliance gang. Well, first of all, stop making me feel so old. I'm only 40. <laughs> No, thank you, Indu. I, I think, um, you know, it's part of the thrill of, of where I am in life is, is the people that have trained with, with us here at Penn that are all over the country. Now, you've mentioned a few of them that have been your guests. I think Chuck Adler and Tanya Samuni and all of them have come through our doors. That's so crazy. I'm very proud of, it's proud crazy. of that. Uh, and and it's, it's a great legacy to have to see these people thriving uh, all over the place. And of course, to see you doing so terrifically. So congratulations to you and keep up the amazingly good work you're doing. Well, thank you. And we'll, we'll continue to try to advocate for patient education too. And you're doing some great things. We'll put that in the chat. We'll link it um, after as well. So, um, you know, because I think that part of, you know, being empowered is in advocating for oneself is it starts with education. And I think that, you know, the PMP Alliance and other groups um, in the country are doing a fabulous job. And I think, you know, just connecting these dots so that you know, you know, what, what you need to ask for and how to get it and how to, you know, really make a difference is huge. So, um, so thanks again, Matt, for your time and, and stay well and, and love to you all and on the East coast there. And uh, I'll right. hand it back to you, Andrea. Yeah. Right, talk Thank to you all you. soon. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stern. Thank you, Indu. Let's give them a big gratitude wave. If you've had your camera off, let's turn it on. Thank you so much. We covered so much. We can't wait to have you guys join us again. Bye now. Thank you. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.